here, something I suspect many politicians are simply afraid to do. So today, we seek to begin a conversation which I think is long overdue. The most challenging task a president can face is to end conflict. And surely, as it is, it is here where we see how clearly, how little progress has been made in the past decades, in recent decades, with race relations in America, and especially with the social political differences. We are too often politically divided. We all too often only see things from our own side. And what we really need is sincere and honest dialogue, and I pray that today we have exactly that. Here to introduce Dr. Paul is a man I am proud to introduce, a man I was searching for and found uplifting force in this community where he has worked tirelessly for 40 years. Reverend Jim Hawley embodies all the same qualities that I admire in Dr. Paul. Courage, persistence, and a deep, sincere love for all humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Reverend Jim Hawley. Crisis of our community 
in our country. And then we would have time for discussions. There is a, as a preacher, I got to preach for once moment. In the Bible, there is Isaiah, the 21st chapter, verse 11. And Isaiah raises this question. The burden of Duma, he called to, he called to me, called to me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? It is nighttime in America. It's nighttime in urban America. It's nighttime in our differences in how we want to solve the problems of this country. I do believe, however, that Dr. Paul is a watchman who's on the wall. Problems. 
because <clears throat> we had a gold standard and gold and honest money, which is biblical, by the way. It says honest weights and measures, and we don't have honest weights and measures. And I'll get into that and why that's harmful. And, um, and, and this uh, is the, and, and the reason why I think it's so important to figure this out. And those economists actually said, uh, <clears throat> refuted this idea that it was the gold standard and free markets that caused our problems. Matter of fact, it had a lot to do with the funny money system that was created by our Federal Reserve System, the paper money, this is honest money that created our boom times in the 20s, but the bust times in the 30s. So once I became convinced of that, that the very, very bad times of the 1930s, that lasted until well after the war. A lot of people then introduced the notion, and we've been taught this in schools, it's wrong, no, it's bad economic theory, it's bad moral theory. And they said, well, we didn't get out of the Depression until we had World War II. Well, that is not true. War never helps in the economy. War always brings wealth. After World War II, troops came home and they worried again, oh, we need more government, more spending, and more mischief going on, print more money, because, uh, you know, we were, our depression would return. But 10 million people came back from the military. Spending at the federal level was actually cut, and taxes went down, and the Depression finally ended. And there was economic growth once again. And that made an impression on me that uh, economic growth uh, doesn't come from just more government spending. Some people say, well, that's wrong. You're in a recession. You have to spend more and more and more. I keep arguing with many in Washington about how are you with that gentleman who won, runs the Federal Reserve called Bernanke. He says you need to... <laughs> you need to print more and more money and this is going to get us out, out of the problem. But the whole thing is, is uh, in, even this last week uh, at the debate, in the, after the debate we had, a, had an interview and they said, well, what's going to happen if the government quits spending a trillion dollars? I said, well, I got a trillion dollars. They say, it won't just be devastating to the economy. And I say, no, the money would still be spent, but the people would get to spend the money. You know, Because we have been in 
this mess for a long time. We have eroded our concepts of the free market, private property, local control of government for so long, it's very difficult to move away. We have national problems, the monetary system is a problem, the debt is a problem, everybody has to pay for this debt. At the same time, there are a lot of local problems too. You have local problems with local governments uh, can interfere and uh, tax and regulate. Some states are worse off than others. Unfortunately, this state is worse off than other states. In, in our district, our district I have in Texas right now, they're building a, um, a caterpillar plant right now and, and looking for workers. At the same time, this state still is, is uh, floundering around and, and trying to get back on their feet again. And there is another disconnect. Uh, there are now over 600 jobs in this country going bad. He said, well, why don't they take jobs? It's the training. People don't have the right training. And they're actually trying to get people to come here to this country to take these jobs because of better training. So I think uh, Hartley's on the right track. You've got to get control of the education. You've got to get people to be wanting to study and be trained and do something so they can take a job. And this is why, one of the reasons why I wanted to come here is because this is an effort. He's not waiting, you know, for the federal government to come in and save everybody. He's trying to overcome. standard, but you can work your way out of it. And in the same way uh, with education, yeah, my ideal of education, matter of fact, I think it should be on, on the responsibility of the parents. <laughs>
doesn't mean that we shouldn't be involved, and I think this is uh, this is where we are today. Because I don't believe the status quo is going to continue. I don't believe we're going to jump out of this recession like the other ones. So we have to change our attitude as a people on what the role of government ought to be and who should have that role. sound money, and that these are the things that, they, that the government can do. Uh, so in, in, at the federal level, you can set an environment that is better, but then you also have to deal with this burden of debt. This, this burden of debt on individuals, you cannot continue with a great amount of debt. If you get over your head in debt, and you can't pay your bills, and uh, you're facing bankruptcy, you have to get rid of the debt. You have to liquidate debt, or you have to work hard and pay off the debt, or you have to declare bankruptcy and get rid of the debt so you can have economic growth again. But that contradicts all the economic theories in Washington. In Washington, they say, if government's in debt, it's different. You need more debt, you need to print more money, you need more inflation, and then you do need more bailouts. But guess what? When they get into that business, what it turns into is a special interest deal. I mentioned earlier that when you destroy a currency, you destroy the middle class. Our middle class is shrinking, the middle class is poor, the country is poor, the, the, the uh, country is in debt. But as you inflate and destroy the money, wealth gravitates to the very wealthy, goes to Wall Street, and to those who are receiving the benefits from government. But then you have a program, well intended, it's a housing program. Well, the federal government says, well, we have to get everybody a house. People deserve to have a house. And some believe they have a right to a house. I don't quite accept that. But I'll tell you what, that motivation may be good, but it doesn't work. You may get people into houses, but all of a sudden, the bubble where the very wealthy are making so much money, uh, that bubble comes to an end. It collapses, and then they panic, and they run to Washington, run to the Federal Reserve, and say, oh, we're too big to fail. We're rich banks, and we're big corporations. If you don't bail us out, there's going to be a depression. What they're worried about is a depression for themselves. They're not worried about the depression for the people. <laughs> they panic, they're in control, the Fed comes to their rescue, not only to the people in this country, but internationally. When they had, when the crisis hit, literally seven to eight trillion dollars bigger than what the Congress says, the Fed just created and they churned his credit, bailing out foreign banks and, 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 and foreign governments, and they're still doing this and planning to do this uh, in Europe. So but what happened? Well, the good intentions of getting homes for a lot of people, they did have their homes, but they're in the middle class, they get poorer, they buy the debt from the, the banks, and all these derivatives, these gambling type of opera, uh, uh, Unisub, so they buy those and they dump them on the people. So we, the people, own the debt. Guess what? The middle class lost their jobs and they lost their houses. So it's a failed policy. And that is the reason that we have to really look at sound economic policy. But we have a lot to do in Washington in restructuring uh, Washington. And I do talk a whole lot about the foreign policy. Because although there are programs that exist in Washington, and technically they probably shouldn't have started, and technically I know of a better way, and yet I don't believe that we should attack those things. The federal government has taught too many people, whether it's in the educational system, in medicine, or whatever, they taught people to be too dependent and to, uh, to, to immediately to immediately change that is more difficult. So my idea is to have priorities. So if you look at what we spend overseas, uh, you know, we are so much more worried about the borders be between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I've been over there, you can't see them, you can't tell where they are, it's a useless effort. <laughs>
poor get poor, the middle class gets wiped out, and, and, uh, and then the poor are desperate, they'd like to get out of the situation of perpetual poverty. So what they'll do is say, well, maybe there's a chance, maybe I can go into the military. Do they go into the military to fight these senseless wars? No, they go into the military for economic reasons and also the satisfaction of, well, maybe I can defend my country. But they don't go into, into the military to go off and invade another country and start another war, which they're perpetually trying to do. So it, it, it then pulls people in, in, in poverty and the minorities end up more in the military. And one of the sad parts that I see is I come across cases quite frequently, there it's not infrequent, where you will have a single mother who will have you know some, several children at home and she's trying to survive, so she'll go and join the National Guard or the Reserves, believing, well, I'm going to defend this country if I have to, but at least I can be here at home. She might end up going overseas like others four or five times. Uh, and that, that doesn't seem like the right thing to do for our people. It doesn't help in any way the poverty crisis. It compounds the family crisis. When you look at, uh, you, you know, what, what some of the consequences are of these wars and, and the men and women going over there constantly, it, it does lead to a lot of divorce. And more divorce, more family problems, more family problems, more difficult problems that we have in getting out, out of this these predicaments. So I, I think that uh, war, war is a drain and it never is a benefit. Some will argue that, you know, the oil will create jobs, but what you have to ask is, well, if you didn't spend this money on the war, how would this money have been spent now that otherwise? It might have been spent building cars here in this country rather than bombs.
Now, on the issue of drugs, as Drugs are very, very dangerous. Of course, the drug war is even more dangerous. But the the uh, drug, we should treat drug, drug addiction like an addiction, like we treat alcoholism. People who become alcoholics, if they commit crimes, that's a different story. If you're on drugs and you commit a crime, that's a different story. But just because you have a problem and you're using peaceful use of drugs, we shouldn't be putting people in prison. If they've been caught three times, no violent act, they can be put in prison for life. At the same time, at the same time, you hear people getting out of prison who committed a problem murder and rape. There's something very wrong about that system. So, if drugs are dangerous, parents should be teaching uh, children the danger of drugs, and sometimes the parents aren't responsible enough to do it. Then the next closest person that should be able to do that, hopefully uh, we can get them into our churches and into our schools, and they should be taught about the danger. But the use of force invites way too much big government. All of a sudden, you have SWAT teams. They're going to track down people. They might be smoking marijuana. They bust in these places. They kill people. And then they find out they're in the wrong place. Actually, if you look at the whole problem of drug usage, uh, prescription drugs are a much bigger problem. secrecy and undermine our privacy, so it's been all twisted around. 
But the understanding of liberty must incorporate the fact that our, our rights and our lives come to us in a natural way or a God-given way, and doesn't, they don't come from government.
And that's why you have to have a prosperous economy. You have to reward people for working and being frugal. And that is that some of the rules that we have is if you save money, uh, two things happen. One, you get taxed on the interest you earn. And also, saving money doesn't help you. The government destroys the money. If you put a, let's say you're planning in five years, you want to go off to school and you start saving money. Well, in five years, your money might be worth less than it was when you put it away. So there's no incentive to do that. And that's why there's no economic growth. So unless you look at the business cycle and deal with the Federal Reserve, and deregulate, change the tax code, get people to bring their money back home because they can make more money overseas, you deal with some of the uh, problems in labor costs. If you don't do, if you don't do that, you can't have jobs. Uh, but uh, it, it is a consequence of many, many years of mischief. They got away with it for a long time because we were so wealthy. It's not working anymore because we're now a debtor nation. We owe the world three trillion dollars, and we owe ourselves, uh, our national debt, sixteen trillion dollars. So we have this dilemma of just paying for the debt. And you're at the age group, you're getting this. And that's why you don't have jobs. But you have to liquidate debt. When I talked about the big uh, banks and corporations who've got too much debt, the debt wasn't liquidated. The debt is still there. But you have the debt. You are a part owner. And that's why the, the earnings go to paying off the debt rather than going in and inviting businesses back. And th this is the whole reason I say, you got to stop the wars. That money shouldn't be spent overseas. It should be spent here. Change the rules here to invite capital in here so we can build cars again, you know, and be competitive. So it's not easy to do Thank you. Another Riverside Preparatory Act. So it's up to individuals. So ultimately, as soon as you're adult, 